Great. Well, yeah, let's get started. Um, so I was, uh, I was hoping I would come into um, this week's session with like a complete uh, notebook on the Airbnb data set, uh, but then kind of at the last minute this afternoon uh, or yesterday afternoon, I realized I had like, a, you know, I made like a big mistake in it. <laughs> so I kind of uh, scrambled last minute to try and fix that. And, you know, here we are. So there's still some work to do, but um, I think what's, what's here is still really interesting to, to talk through. Um, let's see where to start. I think the, uh, the, the data set is, is pretty great. I think this is like the perfect data set for exploring this topic of, uh, um, you know, combining multiple features. So if we look at the, um, it's a, so it, yeah, it's a data set of like 20,000, uh, Airbnb listings. They're all from Melbourne, Australia. Um, I had trouble figuring out kind of the, the history of this data set exactly. It looks like it came from a project uh, called Inside Airbnb, where there looks like a, an organization that's trying to assess the impact of Airbnb on communities. So I think it you know it didn't come from Airbnb, but was scraped by uh, some group. And then uh, the form that, so the, the copy that I have comes from the multimodal toolkit. And their version seems even more kind of cleaned up or something. So I'll have to ask Ken to maybe for some more insight on, on the history of this. Um, but the, the goal is to predict the nightly rental price for each listing. Uh, so if we look at the prices, they, they range all the way from $12 to over $12,000 a night, the median at 112. Um, and then I'll, I did do some, uh, I looked into some of these, like these high end ones and I'll, I think I'll, I'll show you what I found there in a minute. Uh, here's the distribution though. So most of them are, you know, kind of under $300 a night, but then there are, um, there are some that are, you know, between three and 800. And then I, I kind of clipped anything over 800. I clipped to, uh, to 800. So that's what that bar is. Um, otherwise the tail goes, you know, all the way up to 12,000. So uh, let me show you all the features. There's 275 features. <laughs> Let's scroll this down and kind of probably need to zoom this in a lot. Close that for a minute. All right. Yeah, and the, the bulk of them, if I just kind of scroll down real quick, you'll see like, uh, probably roughly like 200 of them are just these uh, binary features where it indicates whether or not it has a particular amenity like a hot tub or uh, whether it allows pets. Um, but then the, the first, I guess it would be 70 or so, um, are, you know, bit different. <laughs> Some of them don't seem very useful. Like there's the there's a number of URLs in here, uh, but there's some good text features. There's the the listing name, the summary, uh, description of the space. Not sure what the difference is between description and summary. Um, let's see. Yeah, you could use you could use the. Uh, uh, we could come back to this and use one of those like text plus a vision models and try to incorporate the um, the URL for, or the I'm sorry the image for the listing to try and factor that into the price. Um, let's see, yeah, and there's there's information about the location. Thought the neighborhood was an interesting one. Um, there's even latitude and longitude so there's the there's the location of the of the listing and i guess there's this field to indicate whether or not that's actually an exact location or not um, yeah so let's see let me show you some of the outliers in the price and then the number of amenities. Yeah. Let's look at the outliers real quick. It's kind of fun. Um, 
All right. So I took I took the uh, took the data set, sorted sorted it by price, looked at the top ten highest um, highest price places. Oh shoot! And then I guess because I filtered it, I lost them here. But hopefully, okay. So these are these are the pictures of the top ten. Um, it looks like my my table is wrong because I did filter out everything above 2500 so i'll have to rerun that to pull up the original original ones but you can get a good idea just from the pictures so this is the twelve thousand six hundred dollar one it's uh i want to say it was like two bedrooms and one bath you do get the whole house <laughs> but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's bogus um this one also over twelve thousand dollars a night so i'm pretty sure that's false as well this guy looks like an architectural masterpiece, so I'm guessing this one is is more legitimate. <laughs> um, that looks pretty swanky. So does that? Looks like a penthouse. So there are there are some legitimately very expensive ones. I think this guy was you know like three thousand dollars a night or something like that, one bedroom. <laughs> so something's something's fishy with some of these. I think they. Um, my guess is. What's going on here is that uh, maybe people like set their their listing price ridiculously high, kind of temporarily as a way of like disabling it, right? Like no one's going to pay this amount, so if I just set the price crazy high, then no one will book it. Something like that. Uh, anyway, so those are those are some outliers where they're you know they're screwing up the data set because they're um, they're they're giving some data points where it's like well this. Whatever features this place has, you know, that should be twelve thousand dollars a night. <laughs> so I filtered those out, um, and then the bottom, the bottom is kind of curious because uh, you know, like the lowest price ones. Um, I can't tell what's going on with these. I think they might actually be legitimate. So let's see. Yeah, room type, private room, twelve dollars a night, but there is like. There's you know 62 reviews, so I think it might actually be real. Um, yeah, so some of these you know have have like a significant number of reviews. Shared room would make sense. So I didn't filter out any of the bottom uh, because there were there were enough that were like under twenty dollars, and I can't. It's not as obvious to me that they're actually bogus. So. Uh, left those in. Let's see. We'll look at more of the features here. That sorry, let's see. Select features, property types. Yeah. Let me actually let me show you the um, kind of what I what I was doing originally, and then and and kind of why that's wrong. I think that'll be. Uh, and then we can look at the the features that that applies to. So here's kind of here's the illustration I had mocked up for what I was doing. I'm gonna zoom out to make it fit. Okay, so similar similar to the um, the clothing review data set that we we looked at previously, we've got some text features and some numerical features like the number of bedrooms and baths. And then we have some categorical features. Um, a lot of them are binary, but then there are, I want to say, like you know, ten maybe that that have kind of uh, text labels to them. So there's there's maybe like fifty different neighborhoods that appear in this data data set. So everything belongs to one of those those fifty neighborhoods. Um, so what I did is I you know I took the took the text features. Just uh, concatenated them, uh, you know, combined them into one string, send that through BERT, take the uh, CLS embedding, and then concatenate the other features onto the end of that. Um, and for the, for the categorical ones, um, convert, you know, define like for each category value, define a unique integer and represent the category by that, that integer. And then, you know, that gives you this kind of extended vector that we send through a, a multi-layer neural network. Um, 
and predict the, the price. So the problem with this is right over here on this, this last category uh, feature. The, the problem is that with, a, with an MLP, uh, when you're sending features into the MLP, the, the, the relative, like the distance between values needs to matter, right? So if a, um, if a, if a listing has like 12 bedrooms, let's say, then that's going to probably cost a lot more than three bedrooms. But like a, a four bedroom place might be, you know, you'd expect that to be closer to the price of a, a three bedroom place. So there's like the relative difference between uh, the values is relevant and the MLP can work with that. But when you, when you do this category encoding, um, neighborhood 45 might not be any more similar to neighbor, neighborhood 44 than it is to neighborhood two, right? So the difference between those numbers has no meaning. It doesn't, it doesn't represent anything about the similarity of um, of those neighborhoods, so this strategy doesn't really work. <laughs> um, the, yeah, the MLP just can't really do anything with this with this feature. So I think there's there's two ways to solve this, and I want to I want to ask Ken like which strategy um, he ended up using. I think what so so one way to do this. So for the, the binary feature, the MLP can work with that because it's only it only has the value zero or one. Um, so you know the difference between zero and one does have meaning. Either it has a pool or it doesn't. Um, so you can convert something like the neighborhood into a binary feature by essentially, uh, let's say there's 50 neighborhoods in the data set. You could add 50 features here that each represent a different neighborhood and make those binary. So um, all of the neighborhoods would be zero except for the central business district, and that would be a one. So kind of a one hot, one hot encoding um, for the category. So I, I, think, I think that may be what Ken did because he said he, he treated them all, he did binary encoding. Um, and at first, I misunderstood that because I thought that the categorical features in the data set were only these binary ones, like does it have a pool or not? Uh, but then I then I discovered like, oh no, there are these um, categorical features that have like multiple labels. So yeah, so I need to I need to clarify with him uh, what he did there. What I tried yesterday afternoon at the eleventh hour. <laughs> um, what I did is I took the because we because we had a lot of success with the clothing review data set of just taking those categorical features and using their text labels and appending them to the text to to feed into BERT. Uh, that's what I did here. So I took the I took these uh, categories that have you know text labels and I included them in the text to send into BERT. And then the, the features that are already binary, like does it have a pool, does it have a bathtub, those I concatenate with the, uh, the embedding. Um, yeah, so that's where I'm at currently. Uh, I will figure out what they did in the toolkit to compare. And right now, um, my, my scores on the data set uh, aren't as good as what they got with the toolkit. But I've been um, I've been conservative so far in like uh, taking fewer features than what they did. So I need to try like taking their full full feature set um, and seeing how that does. So let's see. Um, I think next I was going to show some of the implementation just to give you guys a picture of what that looks like like how you how you build this system um, any any questions so far I wonder if there's anything that'd be worth talking about in terms of like um, you know the method here and the architecture you make sure I've got the chat pulled up all right cool 
So, oh. sorry, Chris, just, just one, one thing. I mean, this is probably cheating because you already know, um, I, I mean, so this is property, right? So we know that neighborhood is, is important because it's location. Yeah. Um, so uh, another option might be, you know, you keep every, so you still have the text stuff that goes through BERT and you have the binary and the numbers, and then you have the category stuff that you treat outside of that. Uh, and then that kind of feeds directly, so you don't combine any of that, and then that feeds directly perhaps into another um, MLP, right? And then you kind of combine the your current MLP with a, with another one, and you come up with a, a, a um, like, and you come up with a version that you're happy with. And and it's not a, I'm just trying to be as complicated as possible. It's only because I know that location is really important, and if you're separating that out in that way. And you're taking all of the other stuff. I think perhaps that might that might give you some insights. Yeah. So to take advantage of uh, some insight about what features are most important, and maybe treat those separately in order to give them more weight. That's right. Yeah. 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 Something I, I really wanted to do was um, apply. Uh, XG boost here uh, because I know you know it's really good at working with both these numerical features and the categorical ones, uh, and then it also kind of has that nice benefit of like um, you can you can try to assess from it like which features are are most valuable in making a prediction. But I guess the the question I had, um, let's see how do I do that? Shift down now. Well, then, um, I can't remember how to like make a new. There we go. XG boost regression. <laughs> can be used for regression. So, yeah. So, the question I had was like, I know you can use it for uh, classification, but can you do it for? Regression. I imagine you can do it with buckets, but let's see if I can, see if I can find out quickly here whether it's like XGB regressor. Yeah. Well, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Okay. So assuming. Assuming that's possible, which it looks like it is, then um, yeah, I'd, I'd say maybe you know taking out those categorical features and sending them along with the output of the MLP, like sending them those into XGBoost, maybe um, might be a, another strategy to try. So yeah, so it, I'll. I'll I think maybe I'll add that as a baseline as well. Like try just applying XGBoost to everything except the text features. Um, I wonder how the output layer of that works. I, yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't really conceive of like how a decision tree would result in a uh, continuous valued prediction at the end. So to check that out. All right. Um, yeah, so let me show you the the implementation here. Um, yeah, so in order to do this, you've got to create a, a custom custom class, um, but you can you know build it on top of BERT for sequence classification from transformers. So uh, it's not it's not that hard. <laughs> So I created one called BERT concat features. Um, it's got a subcomponent, which is the MLP. And um, yeah, and then I, I took I took this from so all of the code really for this this class I took from the multimodal toolkit, uh, but I kind of pared it down to just demonstrate a particular technique. Um, and kind of, I flattened it as well. It's it's more um, the library is more object oriented, so it has like a separate class for handling the combination step. Um, it's got like utility functions, things like that. So I tried to like 
you know, pare all that down into, into something um, a little more straightforward. So the MLP, because, you know, the MLP is not really the point of this exercise, so I didn't really, um, uh, I didn't comment this code, just kind of copied it directly. But then the, the BERT, um, the BERT part is, is the more interesting part here, I think. So this is, uh, this is the part that, uh, that I did go through in detail. So creating this module, uh, you inherit from BERT for sequence classification. And in order to do all the BERT setup, you just call, um, you call the constructor for BERT for sequence classification. And that does, that creates a, you know, a BERT model for you. Um, and it gets stored as self.BERT. So then we just need to do the, the extra setup that we want for, for the output. Um, so feature combination, we need to know the number of labels. Um, we can use that to decide whether we want to do classification or regression. The convention in the transformers library is that if you specify that you just want one label, then that's regression. And then uh, binary classification, you'd say that's two labels. And then you know, multi-class is anything more than that. Um, so you need to know the you need to know the total total feature dimension uh, for the MLP. So the text feature dimension is the size of the bird embedding. So this is always 768, unless you use a different model or something. Um, okay, sorry, just one question, Chris, yeah. on that. So yeah. you know, for the bird for sequence classification, you're saying that you can, if you specify the number of labels as one, you can use the bird for sequence classification as a regressor. I believe that's true, yeah. Could be wrong. <laughs> okay, no, never heard that before. That's really interesting. Yeah. I, yeah, I think I recall seeing that somewhere in the um, in the GitHub code in Hugging Fist. Cool. Okay, thank you. I'll check that out. I'm going to capture a couple notes here. So XGBoost does do all right. So just on, on that comment, Chris, you might want to say BERT for sequence classification, right? Because there, there are a whole load of other things, and it's not just BERT that we're talking about. A little misleading since it does say classification in the in the model title, but um, yeah. So one of the um, one of the paradigms that they use in the transformers library that that we've mostly ignored um, is that they have these. I haven't fully commented this piece, but. Uh, they have these config objects. So for every BERT class, they've got like, uh, or every you know Transformers class, so it could be Roberta or whatever else, um, there's a config object. And we normally just do the, like the from pre-trained call and specify our parameters there. Um, but you can also use these config objects and specify things like the number of labels there. Uh, and then we, we need to use that for this because there's there's some additional uh, parameters that we need to specify. So we need to uh, indicate like the number of numerical features and the number of categorical features. And the way we pass that in is just by uh, sort of manually adding some parameters to that config object. And then we can pass that to the from pre-trained call. So that's that's how I get that information in here. So I can combine, yeah, get the total total combined vector length, um, which you know in that illustration it was we had like two categorical features and two numerical, and then bird is seven sixty eight, so that ends up as seven seventy two as an example. 
Um, batch normalization, that's a feature that's, that's in there in the toolkit, so I, I left it in place. And then need to set up the MLP. So the, the MLP, to set it up, you need to specify like the, the layer sizes, right? How many layers do you want? And what, how many neurons do you want for each layer? Um, in a toolkit, the, they, they've got sort of this like formula or strategy for figuring that out. Um, make sure I'm, whoops, sorry. Make sure I'm zoomed in enough here. I want it to be nice and legible. So basically, they just uh, they divide divide the layer size by four um, iteratively. So just each each layer is one fourth the size of the previous one, and you do that until you know you're down below the number of of outputs that you need, um, and then that that creates your uh, your model. So I wonder down in Retrained. I did try to print those out. So, yeah, down in load model, when we actually create this guy, there we go. Yeah. So it's a, it's got four hidden layers with 192, 48, 12, and three neurons. So, pretty big, pretty big MLP. Um, and then the input size is, uh, you know, 772 or, or, or bigger, really, because there's so many features in this data set. Hey, so Chris, how do you know what the, you said, you know, it's based on the number of output, but because this is a regression, right, we don't know what the number of outputs are. So how did you come to the conclusion that it should be? Uh, yeah, so in a, when you're doing regression, the number of outputs is just one. You've got, you've got one neuron in the end that's, uh, oh, okay. yeah, that's spitting out a price prediction. Right. Okay. And and what's the rationale behind dropping by four every time as opposed to just keeping it the same or dividing by two? Um, I don't know. The uh, they do the toolkit leaves that as a parameter that you can choose. So uh, four is the default dividing by four. Um, but yeah, you could divide by two. Uh, that would what would that do? That would that would result in a larger MLP. Yeah, uh, more hidden states, right? Yeah. Yeah, and, and then um, I guess some some insight on you know why why an MLP. So so normally when we when we use BERT to do text classification, right? We we have uh, just like a simple linear classifier on the output, um, and I think the the reason for that is that you know BERT is this huge, incredibly powerful model uh, that has plenty of mechanisms for encoding everything it needs into the into that one. Um, CLS token embedding. So uh, yeah, it can encode enough information into that CLS embedding that the classification decision is, is pretty simple after that. Um, but what we're doing here, we've got some features going through BERT. So some, some get all that powerful feature extraction to go into this embedding. But then we have these others that are outside that. So uh, if we just did a simple linear classifier here, then there wouldn't be there wouldn't be any like feature extraction going on here. Um, so by by adding a, a big MLP on top, um, we're we're creating the opportunity for the model to be clever essentially with these these additional features. So just just one other question on that. So you know because we we have a reasonable amount of confidence in BERT and that single layer classification outside of BERT. What if we just took that one output, right? Because we're reasonably comfortable there, and then we just put the MLP through everything else, and then and then combine it, so to speak. Because um, you know the the other bits are the bits we're not so confident about. I mean, how 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 would you if if I was to say why don't we do that instead? How would you go about um, uh, you know, how would you go about saying no? I think this one is a better route, and what would the rationale be? Yeah. Um, right. So, what if, uh, what if instead of, um, including the entire CLS embedding, you 
frame. Let's see. Yeah. So I mean, so so the, the reason the, the logic being um, so you have this this output from Bert, right? Which is done done a lot of thing, and it's it almost seems like when you put it through another uh, MLP, you're watering down all the hard work that you've done giving going going through Bert. While as if you just take that output from Bert, uh, and then you have the rest of the stuff pass through the NLP, and then you combine the two, right? Um, that uh, and, and I, I guess I guess it comes down to experimenting and seeing whether it does give you you know this is just a, a thought and um, and it might mean nothing until you actually try it out I suppose that's that's where the answer is. but I just trying to I wonder if anyone on this call had an idea of you know if we did that why might that be a good idea versus you know what we have um, because I don't know so. Yeah, so I, I would say like one approach to implementing that would be to separately fine tune for and then incorporate yeah, separately fine tune BERT and separately evaluate BERT. Um a pre-processing step, kind of. Um, so what that would do, essentially, you would uh, you would take you would take Bert out of this model and take the text features out of the model, and you know, in place of them, you would just have the output of Bert, um, and. I know a potential disadvantage of that is that then the then the the backprop that incorporates all these other features doesn't get to influence the fine tuning of BERT. Um, so that that might be less ideal. It might be I'm trying to think if there would be some advantages to that. Uh, can't think of any advantages, but another way to do it though that maybe would be more in line with your your thinking and, and wouldn't have that problem is if if, if you included just a, a, a linear layer here um, to reduce first reduce the CLS embedding down to a single value. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm thinking what it comes down to is like, like ideally you want you want backprop to be able to touch all of this stuff. <laughs> so in, including Bert in the in the, the the final model, I think um, makes sense. And then yeah, whether it makes sense to like first reduce this embedding before going to the MLP, um, it's not clear to me whether that would like have have an advantage beyond like maybe just making this MLP smaller because <laughs> most of the most of the features going into it are coming from that embedding. Um, yeah, so I I could imagine that it wouldn't really. Um, but it might not help. <laughs> it might, it might like simplify the model a bit, but not really like improve accuracy or. But yeah, it'd, it'd be worth worth a try. I think really in the end, right? That's the <laughs> that's the real way to answer that question. Um, yeah, and this is sort of a you know, sort of a very um, exemplary discussion of like when we were starting, and even when we were just thinking about multimodal toolkits. And we even talked about this a little bit with Ken. It's um, the architecture that you choose because you have so many choices of how best to process inputs and how to layer them and where you put your MLP and you know 
you have basically a big platter of different architecture choices. And because there's no, because multimodal kind of tasks are so different data set to data set, it does just kind of come down to this sort of, you know, you put together your competing intuitions about what would be the best for this specific data set. And then you, yeah, you have to test them. So it's, I don't know if when Chris, you were putting this together, you felt that but when I was looking at these, it was all kind of like, hmm, you know, which one looks like it would be best, you know, maybe if I tried you know, running this through BERT and then taking the output and putting that into a separate ensemble, like there's kind of all of these choices, but I think it, um, yeah, you end up with a lot of um, competing intuitions and sometimes you're surprised. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's a really good point. There's the the toolkit does, you know, it, they tried like they've got like five or six different approaches implemented. Um, and then they did they did find that, you know, depending on the data set, um, like for the review prediction, just converting everything to text worked best. And then for this pricing prediction, um, this concatenation approach that we're looking at worked really well, but then they, you know, they they did uh, they did something else that was that was pretty close. Um, this gating method was also pretty close. So, and then I think for the the pet adoption, which I haven't looked at yet, the the gating method did best. So yeah, there is there's lots of things you can try. Um, and it probably just turns into a Kaggle competition, right? Where you're just <laughs> you're just throwing everything at it and seeing what comes out comes out best. Yeah, it seems like intuition can help you. It's, rather than help you pick out what the best one will be, it can help you rule out one or two. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you always kind of have to do some experimentation. Yeah. Like, oh, this is a text heavy uh, one. I guess I can rule out this approach, but I still have to try all four of these because. I'm just not sure which is best. Right. Yeah, which is which is a bummer for what we're doing here, right? It's like we want to we want to kind of like teach core concepts. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but at least we're kind of looking at you know some of the options um, to get some ideas of how you could how you could tackle this. And I like the simplicity too of the concatenation approach and. I feel like if that, if you can find a, an approach that's relatively simple that works pretty well, then that seems like a good. Uh, it at least seems nice to have a good starting point. Uh, but it feels to me like that's what this is. So all right, so yeah, we uh, we set up set up the model by initializing the MLP, and then we just have to define what the forward pass looks like. Um, you just call, you pass pass everything through BERT, uh, the text that is. And this is actually, when you call self.BERT, this isn't calling the sequence classification model, it's calling the, um, the BERT object below that. So what it spits out is, um, spits out two things. It has a list of all of the output embeddings. So one for every token, there's an embedding. Um, and then there's the CLS token, which uh, something I need to go like dig into that like has been missing from all my explanations of BERT so far. There's this pooling step on the CLS token that I'm not really familiar with. I haven't dug into it yet, but it's like this one last step that's done on the CLS token. Um, and anyway, that's that. We're, that's what we're taking. We're taking that that CLS token after it's after the pooling step. Um, apparently apply dropout to it, and then we do our concatenation. So um, batch normalize the numerical features, and then torch.concatenate. <laughs> Stick it all together. And then we can send that through the, uh, the MLP. Um, there's some reshaping of the output here that I haven't quite made sense of yet. And then our loss function. So if you uh, 
the way they the way they do this in PyTorch, like if you if you specify labels, then um, then it's assumed that you're doing uh, training. So you calculate a, a loss. Um, the number of labels is one. We do regression with the mean squared error loss classification. Then we do cross entropy, which is the uh, soft max. Um, and then if there's no labels, then we don't calculate the loss. So yeah, so fairly, fairly straightforward. Um, what else would we want to look at here? There is uh, another another aspect to this um, that I didn't show in this illustration. When you've got features, when you've got numerical features going into an MLP. Um, the number of bedrooms and bathrooms, those are kind of small integers, so they, they might be fine. Uh, but if you've got something like the longitude and latitude where they range, they're, you know, they're bigger numbers, they range from uh, negative 90 to positive 90 and negative 180 to positive 180, uh, it's good to do some, some feature transformation to adjust the uh, kind of the, the, the mean and the uh, range of those values so that they're all kind of consistent across all of the features. So one of the steps is to, to do some feature normalization on the numerical features. Or even something like the square footage of the house. Right, right. yeah, yeah, that's a better example because that's like in the, in the thousands <laughs> yep. and being fed in with the, uh, yeah, with, with much smaller numbers. Um, I always, uh, something that always like trips me up a little bit there is like, like the, the MLP is powerful and it's perfectly capable of doing those, those transformations itself. <laughs> uh, but I, I assume kind of, it's like, it's just good practice because it, it makes the MLP, MLP's job easier. Um, it doesn't have to learn those transformations and you already kind of know it's a good idea. So why not just do it ahead of time? Um, yeah, so that's that's in there. Could look at the features a little bit more. Right now, so so I've, I've kind of like uh, gradually added. I'll show you the the feature choices from the toolkit. They picked fifteen numerical features, seventy four categorical ones, and three text features. So numerical, they picked. Number of people it accommodates, bedrooms, bathrooms, security deposit cleaning fee, how many guests are included, maybe the cost of extra people, um, number of reviews. So those all look pretty good. I'm a little unclear on these. I think this is maybe uh, how many nights out of the next 30 days are available to book. Yeah. And see if Ken has more insight on that. And then from the, the text fields, he just picked name, summary, and then the uh, description provided by the host about themselves. <laughs> um, kind of a curious one. I think a lot of these are empty, but sometimes some of them say something like, uh, it's like, hey, I'm new to this. <laughs> so maybe that's a good indicator. Um, and then Categorical features, most of them are those binary ones, but then there are, uh, he did pick these 10, let's say, that are um, that have multiple values. So this is, this is kind of where I like, once I looked at this and I'm like, ah, shoot, <laughs> they're not all binary. Um, and I, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm curious about that, that binary encoding technique of like converting these to one hot because like the host location, there's 980 unique host locations apparently. So that would add 980 features to your uh, your your final feature vector. Seems like kind of a lot. Let's see, but yeah, things like the neighborhood seem really valuable. Uh, the property type. 35, that's interesting. I thought it was smaller than that. I guess there's the room type, which is smaller, which is like, it's either like you get the whole house or apartment, 
or uh, it's a single bedroom or it's a shared room. Um, oh, that's right. I did print out property type actually. Let's see. Here in select features, I believe. Is that where I did it? Nope, up here. Here we go. Property types. Yeah. This is kind of fun. Villa. <laughs> that's probably a good, that's a good indicator. Versus hey, so are, are these, are these sorry, sorry, Chris, are, are these ones that you've counted as binary or are these, um, because it there seems an ordinal uh, ordinal element to them, right? Like for example, a shed is less than a room, which is less than the entire house. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. You could you could organize those. There's yeah, you could rank those. Um, yeah, that's a good point. That'd be another way to to encode these is try to. Um, uh, them yeah the, uh, the tricky bit there is then like it's like well to what degree right if you if you label them zero one and two like shared room seems very substantially different than entire home slash apartment so it's like do they really need to be like one three and ten or <laughs> something like that but uh let's see and then uh Part of your question was just yeah how so the way I'm treating those currently is is just as like text so I add in um, whatever this term is I, you know I concatenate that with the rest of the text um, and then Ken said what he actually did is separated each each categorical feature with an SCP token so that's the that's the approach I took this time around instead of saying like property type colon hostile. Uh, yeah, cancellation policy is another good one. Uh, could you talk a little bit to that about you using the SCP token? Yeah, yeah, we discussed that some uh, with the clothing review data set. Um, I think where we landed was kind of that the the uh, so so my my initial thought was that. Um, if you're gonna if you're gonna include these these categories as text features, then it would probably help to give Bert some context to to what that is. So, um, you know, so so the way the way I did that is I, I wrote some natural language where, like, for property type, I might I might have added like um, this is an apartment, um, or I might say the cancellation policy is flexible. So I, I kind of added some additional text thinking that Bert could maybe uh, work with that better. Um, but I think where we where we landed is that uh, just the presence of that token seems to be enough. Uh, you know, Bert can pick up on the fact that like, oh, yeah, this, um, this token is, is significant. And I think the, the SEP probably helps um, helps Bert understand that it's uh, a separate piece of text, um, you know, not to be confused as like part of the next sentence, but being more standalone. Um, so yeah, let's see what I know. I've read that um, there was a paper that you know tried to analyze some of what what Bert's doing and. They they kind of they showed or argued that the SCP token is sort of a no op. Um, so when when a particular when the functionality of a particular head isn't really needed, then uh, 
it focuses its attention on SCP. Um, but that doesn't seem relevant here. <laughs> Yeah, and then and maybe I guess the other the other thought I had is that maybe the uh, the position maybe Bert's able to to um, incorporate the position information. So if the cancellation policy is always in the same position in the input, then uh, maybe that helps Bert as well understand that this is a um, a particular feature in a particular location. Yeah. I'm not sure. That's a lot of uh, <laughs> that's a lot of hand waving there and a lot of speculation, but it seems it seemed to maybe the best best thing to say there is that like I I tried adding additional text. Uh, Ken just did it with SCP token, and they got the same score. <laughs> so the the disadvantage to my approach is that I added a bunch more tokens, uh, which you know increases the sequence length and pushes you closer to that sequence length limitation. So uh, I think if, if just separating them with SCP works, then that's the better approach. <laughs> OK, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, let's see. How are we doing on time? Oh, yeah, we're almost uh, almost done here. If there's any, any last uh, things to look at. Yeah, so currently, currently I just selected a handful of features that seemed particularly worthwhile. Um, and I actually treated the, I'll have to look at this some more. It, it seems like if you're going to, um, if you're gonna treat, yeah, for binary features, like you can kind of just, you can kind of call those numerical. Um, but I suppose that's not what I did here. I just shut off the, the categorical ones. But I am currently, let's see, where are we at? Yeah. So the two, the scoring metrics here are the, the mean absolute error. Um, so meaning for, for every test listing, you just subtract the predicted listing from the uh, predicted price from the actual price, uh, take the absolute value of that, and then take the average. So on average, it's $100 off, <laughs> uh, which seems pretty bad. I wonder, did I put the, yeah. So I also kind of plotted the histogram of errors. Um, and then the RMSE is the root mean squared error. Uh, so very similar, except that the the squaring and the square root, or the really the squaring, um, causes the larger errors to have a bigger impact on the on the score. So the RMSE is always uh, like as large or larger than the MAE. Um, so there, Ken's best score was. Uh, a mean average error of 65, so still pretty far off from that. Um, the RMSE was, he was getting much higher, so I'm, I'm wondering, something's fishy there. Because <laughs> every every test I've done, I've gotten a lower RMSE than that. But uh, yeah, so I'll have to keep uh, incorporating more of those features, I think, and check with Ken about that binary encoding thing. But uh, that's where we're at. Any other? Um, any other questions before we wrap up? No, but thank you very much for your time. It's great. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for your uh, your input, John. Appreciate it. Cool. Well, I will. Um, I'll send out uh, an email when the recording's ready, and uh, Nick and I will talk about what we're going to do next week and, and let you guys know that too. So, thank you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for watching. See you guys. Thanks, later. Chris. Thanks, Nick. Appreciate it. Enjoy the day. Yeah, you too. Bye, guys. Bye.